Hello. Well, this feels like home. Um, I'm a little, I gotta tell you, sitting backstage was a little difficult for me, because normally, you know, I'm kind of out here in the mix, so uh, I'm having a little bit of flashbacks, but I will be okay, I think. So I'm really excited to be here with you today and to be able to kick off this convention. The first time you're seeing each other face to face, many of you in four years. So what a tremendous start to the day this morning and then leading off this afternoon. So I'm again thrilled to be here. I am the United States Fire Administrator. Who would have thunk, right? Um, so here we go. I wanna tell you just a little bit about um, the USFA. So I am pushing the button, guys. I know that's gonna happen soon. Very good. Here we go. Slides are gonna move in a second, I'm sure. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, I know, right? Yeah, that's what happens. There we go. So I, have, uh, I was sworn in about 10 months ago. Uh, the USFA sits inside FEMA. Deanne Criswell is our FEMA administrator. She's also a firefighter, member of the National Guard, deployed to Afghanistan, and she is a great friend to the fire service. Everything that I have asked for, she has opened every door. I can't say enough good things about Deanne Criswell. We do sit inside FEMA. FEMA's mission is to assist victims of disaster before, during, and after, actually, uh, disasters occur, so helping people. And as the USFA sits inside FEMA, we are, are part of FEMA, but we do not share the same mission because our mission really is to prepare and support and strengthen our first responders. And so it aligns very well with what I had got to do in my career here with you, with what you do, um, with we, as we strengthened our firefighters and our paramedics to respond and prepare them for what is next. We have a, a logo that I hadn't paid a lot of attention to, quite frankly, during my time at the IAFF, but I want you to know what it stands for. Because frankly, the USFA had become quite irrelevant in its uh, time over the last few years, and the national organizations like the IFF has stepped up into that space. But we're trying to realign now the USFA to lead the whole of the fire service and to bring our national organizations so that we walk forward with strength. That mission shared in that logo and those four stars align very well with the mission, which is our fire and EMS training and our National Fire Academy, the research agenda, our National Fire Data Center, and I'm gonna tell you all more about these, and of course, community risk reduction. So I was asked today to share with you the state of the fire service, and that's exactly what I'd like to talk about with you today. I'll start by telling you that we still have a major fire problem, particularly in the US, and I know across Canada as well. If anybody tells you that fires are down, it is not true. But our data, because we haven't done it very well, often reflects that fires are down. But the reality of the matter is that they are not. We have had more than 1,400 people killed in, this, in the United States since January 1. We are on a trajectory that will meet 3,000, just like we have in the past 10 years. This year, this is ridiculous that we are still having this many fire deaths across the United States. We just had seven adults and three children killed in Pennsylvania in the last three days. Two sisters killed in a family uh, fire in New York. And so they go on and on. You saw in January the massive killings in the Bronx fire and in the Philly fire, all happening within five days of each other. And so anybody who says we don't have a fire problem still across North America is sadly mistaken. That fire expands, of course, to the wildland urban interface. We have many ignitions that occur in the wildland, but most spread to the interface, and that's where we engage. You see, it's the interface where it begins to affect the built environment and people, and that's where you engage. So we do care about the wildland, but we want to keep it from spreading to the interface. This is everybody's problem across this country. We see it happening throughout North America. We see it happening globally now, many countries, with wildfire. And I want you to pay attention to what I said. I didn't say wildland fire, I said wildfire. I want you to pay attention because those words matter. 
Every time we say wildland, politicians hear things about trees and forests and parks. And that's important, but that's where all the money's been going too. We have to remind ourselves that we work in the wildland urban interface when it meets the built environment and that wildfires are not all connected to wild land. Wild land is a location. The interface is a location. Wildfire is the entity that we're fighting. Because in the Marshall Fire in December just last year, 1,080 homes burned, and it had nothing to do with the interface. It had everything to do with drought and a grass fire. That's a suburban conflagration, not a wildland fire. So I want you to pay attention when you talk about wildfire, that you pay attention to your words. According to NFPA, and one of the big things that I want you to see here is that 88% of our structural fire departments in the U.S. are responding to interface fires. But only about 40% of them have the appropriate training. You heard the GP this morning talk about the wildland urban interface training that the IAFF has developed. It is imperative that we get this deployed because it is training that has not yet happened. Yeah, we're training structural firefighters as wildland firefighters. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about operating in the interface, which is a different paradigm for structural firefighters. And so we're going to keep moving on that front. The USFA just released in June an issues and resolutions uh, guide. If you haven't looked at this, please do. Again, it affects everybody, not just those of you who think you're wildfire firefighters because you're all wildfire firefighters. And so pull this up, have a look, because it contains recommendations, over 130 of them, just talking points for you with your political decision makers. So if you haven't seen that, please have a download of that. I also want you to know about FMAGs. Have any of you heard of the Fire Management Assistance Grants? Well, if you're from California, I know you have. Nevada, Colorado, uh, Florida, North Carolina. Because FMAGs are what happen when you have a wildfire and you need to have pre-positioned resources, then you need an FMAG declaration pretty quickly. And so if you're not familiar with these, I want you to become more familiar with your FEMA regional administrators because that's who approves these. This matters because if we can't deploy and preposition resources fast enough, you all know I don't have to tell you what happens as fires grow. We have to meet it as close to ignition as possible. We have to intervene as soon as possible to stop the risk escalation. It's the same thing, same story we've talked about for years. And so FMAGs are important. Another grant that you might not be familiar with is the BRIC grants. This is the pre-side. This is your community risk reduction side. And I want to tell you that there are almost no fire departments that apply for this. And they're all eligible. If your chiefs don't know about BRIC grants, you need to tell them. There's a massive amount of money much more than an AFG and SAFER for this. So make sure you become aware of BRIC grants, which is your resilience and community resilience and infrastructure building. This has all kinds of eligibility for your department in resources, um, things that you might not think about and is different than AFG and SAFER. So on the wildland front, in the federal government, we have several different entities, and I'm going to talk more about these on Wednesday, but I just want to mention them to you now. We have a Wildland Fire Leadership Council that consists of a lot of federal government organizations and some of our private-owned lands, because what is burning matters when you talk about wildfire. We also have a wildland uh, interagency working group that is exclusively federal government agencies, including forestry, uh, the Department of Interior, Agriculture, NOAA, NIST, all of the organizations in the federal government that work wildfire. And then a new wildfire commission, and I'm just gonna show you this, you can't read it, but I want you to see the color coding. This was a piece of legislation that came down at the end of 2021 in the US that designated a wildfire commission to take on looks at technology, early sensor, because if we can get to those ignitions early, then we stop the spread. And so this commission has just been stood up. The first meeting will be in September. 
The problem is when this commission came down, guess what? There was no structural firefighter, no fire marshals, nobody from our arena in the commission. So we had to fight to be able to get, and when I say fight, we did because the FEMA administrator is one of the chairs. She has since designated me as her seat, so I'll be representing as one of the chairs on this commission, and we were successful at getting two fire marshals appointed to this. And so we are working very hard to make sure that your voice is heard in this commission. We also have cancer. We're still dealing with it. We've heard it all morning. But the National Firefighter Cancer Registry, known as the National Firefighter Registry, is still in process. We are still moving, and USFA is working with NIOSH to make sure that we have the appropriate data to inform this. So the NFR, we're still working on cancer. Obviously, from today's discussion, we still have a major problem, and there is a lot to do. Firefighter behavior and uh, behavioral health and suicide. I want you to know that this report was just released to Congress. If you'd like to see it, it's available online on USFA's website. But what it says, it was a report that I was responsible for releasing, and I told you I've only been here 10 months, right? Well, um, I was responsible for writing a report to Congress on recording suicide data for firefighters who commit suicide. And I'm like, where am I supposed to get the data? It doesn't exist. And that's the truth. The IFF has some data. The NFFF, the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation, has a little bit. But there is no consistent reporting on firefighter suicides. And so that's what that report says. If you all want us to report on suicides, we have to have the money and the capabilities to do so. So I'm working on constructing a database that will house this data, but we still have to put in process a way to collect it. So we're still struggling there. But I want to say one thing to you about that. We must continue to talk about the before suicides, behavior health, rather than the suicides. We can't talk about post without talking about pre. And so we've got to stay on that course. The other thing that we have to continue to address are our codes and standards. We have them. They continue to be passed. But here's our problem. We can't enforce them. Because you're all struggling. We've already heard with recruitment. Most of you are getting you know, extensive overtime these days because we can't recruit enough people. How are we expected to enforce codes and standards? This is another issue that we are taking on within the USFA. And so these two documents, I show you, they're both brand new, coming out of FEMA, and they look really good. Here's the problem. FEMA is a storm-fighting organization. They know everything about hurricanes and tornadoes, wind and water and floods. They're just coming into their own in wildfire, partly because we are now standing up appropriately in USFA. So these two documents, while they are very, very good in codes and standards, they only address wind and water standards. Fire standards are absent from these documents. So we have a long way to go. So at USFA, what I'm doing is reorganizing the USFA. I am tearing down some of the old things that are useless and putting in new operations. We are standing up an EMS branch. Can you believe that? Two employees in EMS in USFA, two when that's 70% of what you do. And so we're going to have an EMS branch. We're going to break out a research center and a data center so that it's this infers that we've had for years, the National Incident Fire Reporting System, it's going away, by the way. We're gonna be standing up a new cloud-based data system. And we're also realigning all of the wildland um, interface people to report directly to headquarters and to my office, and so we're gonna talk much more about wildfire along the way. So here's part of the realignment. Community risk reduction is gonna be on the forefront. We're gonna look at preventing, because the fire that doesn't happen, you don't get exposed, you're not in a risk environment, so we have to focus more on community risk reduction as we continue to move along. In standing up that new research center, I'm also gonna be opening up a slot for a GS-15 which is the top GS level in federal government to lead this new research, research center. So we're gonna be looking for somebody to lead the new research center, the new data center, and these are some of the focuses that came out of the national research agenda. Recruitment strategies, how timely is that? These are some of the things we're going to address. 
the translating tactical research, everything that UL is doing, translating that into training that we can deliver nationwide. Continuing to focus on acute and chronic health risk for you. Looking at firefighter health and safety and all of the things that we've talked about um, this morning and even now. We're also gonna be looking at the risk mitigation, firefighter injury and fatality, occupational disease from the operational environment. Not, should not be surprising, we've always sat in that arena. Mitigation strategies, looking at your performance capability, certain your, your PPE. And the last one is effective communication strategies. Now what does that mean? That means that you remember at the very beginning I told you we still have a fire problem in this country. Part of it is that we cannot get the general population to understand and listen to fire safety messaging because often we're talking to each other. We're very good at preaching to the choir in the fire service, aren't we? But we need to get the public to listen when we can get them to engage in public safety. All of this resides around data. You guys know I can't get through a talk at all without saying data, first of all, but we have to look at our data system. And we're going to be standing up, as I said, a cloud-based environment, new technology, you're not gonna be entering data into a records management system anymore. It's going to be app-based, we're gonna use a lot of AI, we're gonna use a lot of Internet of Things connections so that we can load data that already exists rather than asking you to put it in because we already established you're not very good at it, right? All right, so with things to do, here's what I want you to understand because I'm already talking to the chiefs about this but these are some things that have to happen if we're gonna be successful in changing the face of data in the fire service, which drives everything. We gotta have a new data standard. We're already working on that. In any phase of the data standard, no more than five clicks. If you're engine one, first engine due in, no more than five clicks. You set up rehab, that's another five clicks. So the data that we're going to be entering through app-based applications are going to be minimized to the must-have not the nice to know. We also have to customize and standardize our dispatch codes. If you've only seen one CAD system in the country, that's how many, you know, it's dispatch codes are ridiculous. We do not need 240 different EMS type calls. So, right? <laughs> so, we have got to have a national standard for dispatch codes. So we're working with the next gen 911 folks uh, we're drilling down, just trying to get to who's in charge here and trying to figure out if nobody's in charge, we're going to take it over and figure out how to write a new dispatch standard. And so we're going to have that fight. So when it comes to you and your chiefs are asking or your CAD operators are asking, this has to happen. If we can't normalize our data, then I can't fix the problem we just talked about with your data entry because that's a pain point for us. And then the other pain point will be transitioning your department on the new system. So get ready. You're going to have to come along. It's not going to be simple. But we're going to get this done so that we can have near real-time information, not two-year-old data, when something happens and we try to defend your actions or someone else or whatever happened on scene and we're looking at 2020 data. That is completely unacceptable. So these things are happening. This is coming. I just spoke to you about the public and their indifference often in listening to fire safety messages. So one of the things that we've stood up is a fire and life safety communicators initiative. And if you have PIOs in your department that want to be part of this, we want them. If you have PIOs in your local that want to be part of this, we want them. This is all of the national fire organizations who have come together in this initiative to align our messaging. Because as I said, we can't have NFPA talking about something at the same time IFF's trying to get a message across. We need to be aligned in our messaging. The mainstream media won't even pick it up if we're all over the place. And so we're working very hard to align our messaging. And I have to say, the general president was absolutely, we're in, what do you need? When I called and said, we've got to do this. And so the IFF has been one of the leading organizations in this group. We are taking on the DEI focus, certainly, just like you are, but I want you to think about DEI when it comes to those who are dying in fire deaths. They, too, have a lack of equity. Two-thirds of the people who die in the U.S. are poor and people of color. Why? 
because safe and affordable housing are a choice. If I want to have safe housing, often it's not affordable. So what's my choice? So we are looking at this from an equity perspective and how do we address this as firefighters? How do we address those living in vacant buildings and the three that were killed in Baltimore because someone set a fire in a vacant building because they had nowhere else to go? We have to continue as firefighters to address those things with the potential to kill us. And so these are things that I, I say to you, our motive is step up for fire safety. How do we do that? Well, we've put in kind of a, and this came from the Army Leadership um, Guide from West Point, and it's a little book called Be No Do. And if you ever sat with me in an alts class, years ago you learned about Be No Do in leadership. We're applying it here to fire and fire safety. Be No Do, so we can keep it simple. So even non-English speaking, we can get across points with graphic representation. Be aware of smoke. What do we want them to know, right? What do you need to know about smoke? And so we're trying to develop graphics that will, what do we want them to do that will help us communicate the messaging? And so as we do that, all of these things I've just said to you are going to culminate in October. We are calling, the USFA is calling the national organizations together for a presidential summit on fire prevention and control. The very first conference on fire prevention and control happened 75 years ago in 1947 when President Truman called on the conference to come together and he called on Congress to address, at that time, 12,000 fire deaths a year. It's been 75 years since one of these conferences have been held. I think that's long enough, don't you? When we still have a problem with fire deaths in this country. We still have a problem with firefighters not being appropriately cared for and not have the right training and the right PPE. So these are the subject matters that we have that we'll be addressing at the round table in October. And so as we move forward, we want to recognize still that fire is everyone's fight, including the President of the United States. So talking about the President of the United States, I wanna tell you a few things about Joe Biden and what he's already done for you. Because I think it's important that you understand that. He's already appointed a special claims division in the Department of Labor so that we can process federal firefighter cancer claims more effectively and more efficiently. He's already launched the Cancer Moonshot Initiative that is going to help us, and you heard this morning, we don't have all the screening types we need and so it's going to help us reach those screening types that we need for firefighters as well. He has reformed the PSOB benefits so that it extends to training as well and firefighters who were killed in training. It opens up the eligibility for those with permanent disabilities. And he's also provided $300 million additional to the AFG and SAFER grants. He's also signed an executive order focusing on the dangers of PFOS. We've talked about that a lot, haven't we? And the dangers of PFOS and trying to understand more that we must demand products free of PFOS.